I'm in New York City with Greg Pallast, investigative reporter, government conspiracy expert, and the author of Billionaires and Ballot Bandits, How to Steal an Election in Nine Easy Steps. Greg, welcome to The Conspiracy Show. Glad to be with you. State of the Union, what is the state of American democracy? Uh, well, it used to be <laughs> that they counted votes. Now, actually, we've always been stealing elections in America. We don't have the culture in, in the USA of counting ballots. If you can deep six your uh, opponent's ballots and get rid of them, or say that people with the wrong color skin can't vote, hey, that's American as apple pie. We are an apartheid election system. Uh, now, though, it's gotten uh, the election theft has gone into cyberspace. In the, in the 2008 election, 2008 election, we had 5.9 million votes disappear. That's the official, by the way, that's the official number. We have something called the U.S. Elections Assistance Commission. They don't assist us much, but they keep track of how many votes just go poof. 2.7 million ballots were cast and never counted. 3.2 million voters disappeared from the voter rolls, who were legal voters, just poof. Now, in the 2012 election, and we don't have all the data yet, we may never get it. They're not exactly in the mood to, to do this count of the non-count for us. Uh, but, you know, I figure it's about double. Greg, if you could explain the mechanics, how registered voters are removed from voters' lists. Ah, well, uh, as I say in, in Billionaires and Ballot Bands, to call it how to steal an election, nine easy steps, because there are nine systems, and many of those involve eliminating voters from voter rolls. How do they do it? Uh, they have a lot of reasons to decide that you don't deserve to vote. You are, uh, you, in Florida, only some states, uh, you're not allowed to vote if you've been convicted of a felony crime. Uh, in some states, if you're insane, unless you're the governor of Florida, that's an exemption. Uh, and uh, of course, in America, if you're not a, a US citizen, if you're an illegal alien. Uh, so, or things like you're inactive, whatever that means, you're a uh, suspicious signature, you name it. There's a bazillion reasons why they can take your name off, the voter rolls. And the, the trick is, is who takes them off and who gets taken off? Well, back, it started, my investigations be, uh, began with uh, the simple system of, of uh, purging in Florida. Each state does it separately. So in Florida, in 2000, when Bush was running against Al Gore, Catherine Harris, who was the Secretary of State of Florida, she was in charge of the voting. She was also the chairwoman of the Bush re-election campaign at the same time as being in charge of the vote count. Before the election was even held, she knocked off nearly 93,000 voters off the voter rolls of Florida, 93,000 people saying that these are people who have been convicted of felony crimes and had illegally registered to vote. So she, the names went poof. I investigated and went through the names and found out that the overwhelming majority of those removed were black voters, African Americans. Now, I'm not guessing because in Florida, BLA is marked next to every black voter in Florida. It says BLA. And so what they did was they went through, they used databases, big massive data mining systems, I, uh, and they went through and found names of convicted, of convicted felons from around the country. And they then found the same name in Florida and, and removed their name. So if they found a black voter, so for example, here's an example. Robert Moore was convicted of a felony crime. In Florida, there are many Robert Moores. They lost their vote. But not only Robert Moore, but Bobby, anyone with the name Rob or Bobby Moore, the nickname. So Bobby Moore was removed. Uh, this is an actual example. Bobby Moore was, was removed from the voter rolls. Mrs. Bobby Moore, Mr. Robert Moore commits a crime, convicted. Mrs. Bobby Moore loses her vote in Florida. Now, and they know it's a black voter because it says BLA. And we went through the list. It's not that there are a lot of innocent people on the list. They were all, all, every single one was a legal voter. Every one. George Bush became president of the United States on the basis of 537 ballots in Florida 
with tens of thousands of black people denied the right to vote. So George Bush was elected through a, what we call a, lip, uh, a laptop lynching. And yet we were told that Florida, uh, what happened in Florida, we had a lot of dangling chads and, and, and ballots that were disqualified. So why blacks, were, why were they targeted? Well, it's, blacks were targeted by the Republican Party, not because of the color of their skin, but because of the color of their vote, uh, blue Democrats. Uh, they also targeted, uh, for example, they, they've had other systems, too, that they've used to target voters. Um, in purging is one system. We call uh, Caging is another system. Carl Rove, who was the senior counsel to George Bush, later became head uh, during the 2012 election of a group called American Crossroads, which is supposed to be, by the way, a social services charity. They got a quarter billion dollars. Their charitable work were things like Carl Rovers uses databases for sending out letters to voters, but they mark do not forward on the letter. When the, if the voter isn't at, isn't at home and their letter isn't, can't be forwarded, it goes back to Carl Rove. They then took all these letters that came back. They were literally in a physical cage. They took the caged letters and then challenged those voters as voting from fraudulent addresses. Now, maybe there were fraudulent voters, except that they weren't. They've never, they didn't arrest a single one of these so-called fraudulent voters. It, it's a go-to-jail crime. You commit ballot fraud in the United States. As a voter, you will go to jail. I mean, you got your a name and address there. It's very easy to catch it. So, but thousands of people were challenged on their votes. Black voters. And now, how did they do this? They sent letters to, um, to colleges, college students, who in August, when they were away for the summer vacation, so going to visit your parents is not a reason to lose your vote. They sent it to elderly Jewish voters who, who almost overwhelmingly vote Democratic. Elderly Jewish voters in Miami who go north. They're called snowbirds. They go north in August to visit their grandchildren. So you visit your grandchildren, letter arrives, you lose your vote. And one of the really, uh, one of the, probably the cruelest list I found, they sent thousands of letters to military bases so that if you're registered to vote, you're a soldier, you register at your military base. If you're not there, the letters return to Karl Rove and they challenge your vote. Now that means that soldiers under fire on the front lines in Afghanistan, in Iraq, or our latest, whatever our latest war is going to be, you lose, your vote gets challenged and you don't even know it. I talked to one soldier who said, I got to vote. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I mailed in my ballot from overseas. And I said, was that ballot counted? He said, I don't know. I said, no, you were on a challenge list. That meant that when your ballot came in, some little asshole with a Blackberry had your name on it and said, no, no, that's an illegal voter registered from false address. What's the false address? The false address was the Naval Air Station in Jacksonville, Florida. Active duty soldiers. And this is the game that they're playing. That's caging. That, now we've gone through purging and caging. This is... And they have so many tricks like this, and they get away with it. Twelve of the last 20 years, we've had a Democrat in the White House. So is this a case of the Republicans are doing it to the Democrats, the Democrats are doing it to the Republicans? How does that work? Ballot theft is class war by other means. It's always the 1% doing it to the, to the, the most vulnerable voters, black, poor, generally. It, it's not, you know, that's the main voters who are vulnerable. And um, it's Republicans knock out literally millions, millions of Democratic votes this way. And Democrats also play this game, and they knock out hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Democratic votes. And they say, well, wait a minute. The Republicans go after Democrats, and the Democrats go after Democrats. What we found is that almost all vote theft by Democrats is again against the most vulnerable voters. And this is because in the US we have these, within the Democratic Party, there's endless vicious primaries. We have, remember, we have a vote before a vote. We have these primary votes. And, um, and so it's about stopping the voters who are voting in the Democratic primary. So for example, one of the worst cases of voter suppression I've ever seen was in New Mexico, aimed at Hispanic Democratic voters, poor Hispanic voters lost their votes. Again, soldiers were 
uh, targeted. We had uh, a precinct where all the ballots, again, from overseas, from the, from the soldiers, came into New Mexico. Hundreds of votes. Not one soldier, not one, voted for president, at least according to the machines that the state ran. Almost every one of these voters was either Hispanic or um, Native American from the Pueblos. They're all Democrats, all of them. Not one of them voted for president. Why? Uh, because who, who deep six their votes? The Secretary of State is a Hispanic Democrat, Rebecca V. Hill Heron. I called her up and I said, well, what happened to those soldier votes? I mean, none disappeared. How did that happen? She said, those people can't make up their minds. Now, who are those people? A lot of people would say, well, aren't they her people? She's a Hispanic Democrat. No, she's an old line, old, established family, ultra wealthy Hispanic who doesn't want her party taken over by the riffraff. And so what's happened is that's what happens. I, I'm glad to say that she's on trial now. Uh, I hope to uh, hope I had a, a, a role in making sure that she serves time. But that's rare. She got caught uh, actually taking money from the, uh, from the voting machine companies. Now, so you have this weird situation, this horrendous situation in which Republicans are going after Democrats, Democrats are going after Democrats. So obviously, on a national scale, that helps the, uh, the Republicans. But it is not partisan. It's class and it's race. In 2000, it came down to Florida. In 2004, Bush versus Kerry, it came down to Ohio. What happened there? Well, actually, it came down to New Mexico, Ohio, Iowa, Colorado, but people weren't noticing anything but Ohio where it was in your face. Because in New Mexico, the election was actually stolen from John Kerry by the Hispanic Democrats. By, in fact, the guy who stole the vote was the head of his campaign in New Mexico, Bill Richardson, supposedly Hispanic Democrat. But again, that had to do with internal party politics. They had to suppress the, the vote so that, um, for example, George Bush won that state, won a completely Democratic Hispanic state by 5,000 votes. Impossible, because they had tens of thousands of votes thrown in the garbage by Hispanic Democrats in, in their wars against the poor. So but they didn't care if George Bush won. I talked to one lawyer, I talked to Richardson, and said, my God, we will pay for the recount. And he said, no. Also, he wanted to run for president, and my carry bit the dust. But so, again, it's not partisan, it's class war. Um, Iowa, where we think of nice people milking their cows. You know, they're just uh, all those corn-fed, uh, bloated-up Americans, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, kind of, uh, you know, with ex uh, carrying around 92 extra pounds of carbohydrate. Uh, the, in fact, massive vote loss there through another system called spoiling, in which votes are cast and they don't count them because if there's an error, the supposed error on the ballot. If you're African American, your chance of your vote getting spoiled is 900% higher than if you're white. Now, I've taken you all over the country. Now let's return to Ohio. Once again, the George Bush presidential campaign chairman in Ohio is a guy named Ken Blackwell. The guy in charge of counting the votes in Ohio is Ken Blackwell, Secretary of State. And by the way, this, he, he's a great illustrator of the issue of class war. He's African American. And I don't think I've seen a more racist attack on the voters than by Ken Blackwell, African American. Um, what he did was, there were, there were many things. First of all, there were good old hanging chads. People don't realize. It was just like Florida, but very few people understand this. It, Hanging chads were a big part of the problem in Ohio because what they, a uh, hanging chad is, in America we uh, used to have the majority of voters use punch cards. You punched a hole in a card. Well, you didn't know when you punched a hole in a card that there may be a little teeny bit of that piece of paper that's still hanging there. Now, if it goes into a vote counting machine, that little piece of paper is going to stop that card from being read. Now, there's two things that, that, the, that they can do. They can eliminate the chads, just hanging. It's clear you voted, just some pieces hanging. In fact, the Republicans had something called a scraper crew. And they took uh, people who are um, mentally disabled, and they gave them little sticks, and they told them to, to scrape off the chads. Now, the reason they use mentally disabled people is that if they're ever questioned about this 
they can't be used as witnesses in courts because they are under the U.S. law. Uh, it's called non copus mentis. You can't ask them, well, what did you do? You, uh, we can't say. Now, I actually think it was a good idea to have scrapers. If someone's voted, just because you have a piece of paper hanging doesn't mean that, you're, that you should be, uh, um, your vote should be lynched. Your vote shouldn't be hung by your chat, okay? Now, but that's what was happening. That was a lot of the vote loss in uh, Ohio. In the Republican areas, they got rid of the chads. In the Democratic areas, they said, oh, hanging chad, throw out the vote. Boom. Now, that was one part. They did something else. After I ran my reports in, on the theft of the vote in Florida through purging innocent people, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus, members of Congress who are African American, demanded something called a provisional ballot so that if your name is missing from the voter rolls, you can vote anyway, and then they're supposed to check it and see, oh yeah, this is not a, a criminal. This is a legal voter. Um, so they got the provisional ballot but they never got the right to have that ballot counted. So they give out literally millions in America at each election time. They give out a couple million, about a million and a half of these kind of bouncing ballots. You fill them out and they don't get counted. In uh, 08, I was able to get the, the exact amount. It was 767,000, you know, over nearly a million votes of these ballots were just thrown in the garbage. There's no, not one instance, not one out of 767,000 where anyone has showed that there's even one single illegal voter. Not one. All these legitimate votes thrown out. Again, overwhelmingly, the poor, black, Hispanic, Native American voter. In Ohio, there were tens of thousands of provisional ballots thrown in the garbage. The other thing is, in Ohio, they, um, they removed, again, thousands of people as felons, criminals, people with felony records, not allowed to vote. But in Ohio, if you serve your sentence, you can vote. They literally removed people on the grounds that they were felons, convicted felons, when you don't lose your vote in Ohio if you have a felony conviction. You know, after all, I mean, we have a, remember, this is, everyone knows in America, it's very easy to end up in prison at some point, depending on your status. So we have had a president, uh, Mr. Obama, who had a little blow, but he didn't go to prison because he had the Harvard exemption, and the guy before him had the Harvard exemption, George Bush, who did a lot of blow. But you know, but if you're you know poor kid, you go to prison, you get a record. So in most of America, you do not lose your vote if you're a uh, if you have a felony conviction. But they've been removing literally hundreds of thousands of names from the voter rolls all over the country as felons because you can't vote in most states if you're actually in a prison cell. What they don't explain to me is how are these, so they're claiming when they take off all these names that you're going to have, that you have tens of thousands of people in each state breaking out of prison, running to the polling station, voting, then breaking back into prison. It's quite amazing. But that's, you know, here's the thing. I'm telling you. I can be on Canadian television, I can be on British television, Swiss, French, and Latin American TV. I'm not allowed to talk about this on American TV. Not at all. I'm assuming that the data mining is sophisticated enough that when they remove someone from the voter roll, they're doing these strategically in those districts that are tightly contested. Is that, is that the way it works? Oh, yeah. When you say sophisticated data mining, I would, let me tell you, the FBI would be jealous of these systems. The Koch brothers have a data mining system which is called Themis. And as they brag, they know whether you've bought pornography in the past week. They have all your credit card records. They know your purchase. They, they have complete details about your life. So they know your voting habits. They know they not only know who you vote for, but your voting habits, which are very important. It's a very, very sophisticated system. For example, here's how they use Themis in uh, Wisconsin. We have a, a system in some states where you can recall, get rid of a politician in office. You fill out petitions, and they have to have they have to be go before the voters in a special election. In Wisconsin, this uh, the Koch brothers had basically installed a governor through massive donations. Very, very unpopular guy. 
so that most voters in the state actually signed a petition saying remove him. Now, if most voters actually sign a paper saying get rid of you, you should be toast. No one in American history, actually, not one governor in American history has ever survived the recall. Yet this guy survived the recall. How did that, how could that happen if most people already said this guy's got to go? How does he win? How does he stay in office? The answer was this sophisticated Themis machine. Koch's put him there, now they had to keep him there. Um, so here's an example of how the Themis machine is used. They set up an organization, the Koch's um, head of one of their political groups, set up an organization called United Sportsmen of Wisconsin. And um, then they went through their, the Themis machine, clearly, and they took out who is, a, who is a Democrat, who has a gun license and is a hunter, uh, who, uh, is, who has, is likely to vote by an absentee ballot. About a third of Americans vote earlier through mailing in their ballots. Who's likely to mail in their ballot, Democrat, have a gun, live in a rural area so that they're less likely to be aware of, uh, of other things going on around them, uh, like, like who's going to off to vote today. Um, and so they, they had a whole bunch of conditions. They were able to target certain voters. They sent them letters from this phony group, United Sportsmen of Wisconsin, and said, okay, um, don't forget, you know, hunters like us have to make sure that we get our vote, our ballots in. And uh, request your ballot from this address and send it into this address by this date. Both addresses were fake, so if you put in your ballot request, um, you didn't get your ballot. If you sent it in, you mailed it to the wrong place, it would also be lost. And they gave a date too late. To, you have to put, mail in your ballot before the uh, official election. It would be too late to count. So it's brilliant. In other words, so they, because they use this uh, fancy data mining system, they're able to cross the, this information and target people. A uh, far less sophisticated method, apparently, that was employed in, in Florida, perhaps elsewhere. Um, again, black voters were telling the story that uh, there were people driving around with uh, loudspeakers on their car telling them that the address of the polling station had closed, or had moved, rather. Uh, were you able to verify the, any of those reports? Um, I haven't been able to verify the, the, the old cheap retail, that's the old cheap retail steal. Actually, the Democrats are great at that. And many years ago when I was in Chicago, the Democratic machine, again, by the way, the Democratic machine of Chicago was expert at removing black voters, which, and in fact, you know, the interesting thing is there's always the story about how uh, Mayor Daley stole the election for John Kennedy back in 1960 by taking, by a sudden massive increase in votes in Chicago, which gave John Kennedy the the state of Illinois. Actually, that's not what happened. It was the first election in which the vote wasn't stolen because for um, decades, the, the Irish Chicago Democratic machine had to suppress the black vote, which was the actual majority population of the city of Chicago. Uh, so what they did was is that they, they were suppressing the black vote. In the year that John Kennedy ran for president, and remember, all vote, as I said, it's class war and it's also local politics more than anything. The Republicans were running a popular guy for the office of Attorney General of Cook County. Now, there's this state prosecutor. He was a guy who was putting Democrats in prison for corruption. They had to get rid of this guy. So it happened to coincide with the presidential election. So what Daley did was he basically allowed 200,000 black voters who were previously barred from voting, he allowed them to vote. So basically for the first time in Chicago, in 1960, you had an election that wasn't an apartheid Jim Crow election, and that elected, made sure that the Republicans didn't take control of the prosecutor's office. John Kennedy was just kind of like a collateral man, uh, issue. By the way, in Florida, that's true too. The, the wipeout of the black voters in Florida was not meant to elect George Bush. Very few people understand this when I went through it. It was meant to elect Jeb Bush as governor. And because they thought Jeb Bush was going to have a tough race, so you knock out the black voters. He didn't because uh, his opponent died. But two years later, his brother became the beneficiary of uh, the wipeout of the black vote, which was meant to actually elect Jeb. So 
vote theft is a, there's a kind of complex chess here. Uh, back to Florida. Hmm? Yet in 2004, when the election was stolen from Kerry, Bush's fellow bonesman at Yale, he did stand up and make a bit of a stick. Not at, no, not at first. John Kerry also went to the mat at first. In fact, um, because I was dealing with his vice president, John Edwards, vice presidential candidate, John Edwards, Edwards was fuming mad because Edwards assumed he would be the next presidential candidate for the Democratic Party and may have been if he didn't get his thing caught in a zipper. And um, so Edwards was fuming that Kerry had gone to the mat just like Gore over Ohio when we were talking and he knew, he knew that the black vote had been suppressed in Ohio and he promised, by the way, Jesse Jackson that he would not go to the mat, that he would not fall down if the black vote were stolen as it was in Ohio by a black man. But again, it's really more class than, it's not racial, it's class. It's that race in America is kind of a, of a, of a marker of class. And uh, so Kerry fell apart and gave in. But later, later, he decided to stand up because he read my book. It was interesting, and I don't know if you remember, there was a scene, uh, 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 there was, uh, this happened in Florida a couple of years ago. A student at the University of Florida stood up holding a yellow book saying, Senator Kerry, why did you give up? Why did you concede the presidential election when according to this book, you won? Okay, the book was my book. The kid was, was getting, then they grabbed him and hit him with a taser. And he famously said, don't tase me, bro. Um, by the way, as he told me later, while he was being tased, he still wouldn't let the book drop to the ground. And he gave it to the cop who tased him. But more interesting, and just as interesting, is that John Kerry said, I've read that book. That's Greg Palace book. And, um, Yes, he was right about the election. This was known to him. Why did he just lay down and roll over? Why didn't Al Gore stand up? Well, it's a biological is issue. Jellyfish don't have spines. Um, Al Gore knew about this because I did the story for uh, The Guardian of Britain and uh, then uh, amplified it on BBC television, Newsnight. Gore knew his, uh, uh, his people were informed directly that I had the information on how the vote was stolen from him. This is before the Supreme Court ruled. And the first thing that one of his people said, they said, oh, that's great, who's the reporter? And they said, Greg Palast. And Gore's guy said, oh, we hate that son of a bitch. Of course they do, because I've been going after both parties for a very long time. Gore had the information before the Supreme Court ruled that he had lost the election. And, but his, one of his insiders said, okay, who's the reporter? This is great stuff. And then when they said Greg Palast, uh, he said, oh, we hate that son of a bitch. And Gore was convinced that he couldn't win it anyway, no matter what the evidence. It was clearly a steal that even with my solid evidence, he wouldn't win and that he would jeopardize the fabulous riches he would be rewarded with for going to the mat. Al Gore left government with a net worth of two million dollars. Now he's worth over 100 million dollars. So going to the mat pays well. At, right after Al Gore went to the mat, there was an election in Mexico which was also stolen. Same, same type of games that were played. I went down there and covered it. But the the losing candidate actually held rallies, held a people's inauguration, refused to accept, refused to accept that an election can be stolen. And of course, he was politically and financially ruined. He's now making a comeback, but you know, it, it takes a lot of guts to say count the votes. And in America, what people do when, when there's a crisis is they grab their TV remote and they, uh, you know, turn on the food channel. Or uh, here comes Boo Boo or hello Boo Boo, whatever. Uh, <laughs> when Kerry saw our investigation in black and white on the page and saw it on BBC, he realized that he just simply, that he should not have given up. And he put in a law with Teddy Kennedy at the time that would make voter caging, remember that system of sending out 
that Karl Rove did sending out letters to people and, and as a way to knock out their ballots. He tried to make, he's tried to make voter caging illegal. And so Kerry took a while, but he finally came around to the idea, which I keep saying, it's not the politician's vote, it's ours. It's not John Kerry's vote to concede. It's not Al Gore's vote to, to give up. Al Gore was not an, uh, a voter in Florida. Al Gore is not Willie Steen. Willie Steen was a Gulf War veteran. Is a, a, Willie Steen is a Gulf War veteran. Was uh, in 2000, young black man uh, who was went to go vote with his five-year-old son to show him what democracy was like in America. Because after all, black people were just allowed to vote a few years ago in Florida. So you want to say, look what we've won. And then they told him in front of his five-year-old kid, your daddy can't vote because he's a criminal. He's a convict. He never had a parking ticket. Okay. So what was, what was the problem here? One, he was black and young. And that was it. They were going to get him. But in fact, um, his name, I looked in the list. Willie, his name is Willie Steen. He was denied the vote because someone named Willie Osteen, like an Irish name, Willie Osteen was a convict. That was the game that's being played. See, so, um, but Al Gore is not a black Gulf War veteran who lost his vote. He's just a rich politician. Uh, very quickly, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like you to talk about these electronic voting machines. How prevalent are they? Who owns them? Yeah, electronic voting, that is computer voting, is a new dangerous casino slot machine of ballots. Now, it is the number of, of electronic computer, what they call DREs, direct recording, so that there's no paper, paperless voting, um, has become the number one system of voting in the U.S. since the 2000 election. And that obviously leads to all kinds of fun possibilities. Now, one thing that people have been concentrating on is hacking the computer vote. You know, that someone's down there switching, playing games with the software, switching the tallies. That's a very, very complex and difficult thing to do. I'm not saying it's not done. It's certainly possible to do. It's hard to find. But there's a tremendous, tremendous vote loss, that vote spoiling. The best way to steal a vote with a computer is to unplug it. People don't, it's really easy. You don't need very, you don't need to be a software engineer to steal a vote with a computer. Unplug it. And that's what was hap that's been happening all over the United States. What I mean by unplug it, anything that causes a computer to glitch, you know, basically, um, if you think that if your computer crashes with Windows, these systems aren't anywhere near as stable as, as, uh, as a Windows system. But it's not random. The glitches miraculously seem to occur in poor areas, and they know it. It's set up to be that way. Dumbass tricks like... Um, not giving poor precincts, workers in poor precincts, um, passwords to open the machines in the morning. Um, giving them memory cards that just go zap. Oh gosh, something went wrong. There's nothing, I mean, in Katherine Harris's own district in Florida, the Republican running for Congress won by 500 votes. They had just put in brand new computer voting machines. 18,000 votes disappeared. They just disappeared. And they said, well, we don't know who these people voted for, but they were in the poor areas. They know that they, these were all, you know, basically Democratic votes. 18,000 votes miss, missing. 500 votes go uh, to the Republican, uh, creates a Republican majority. Zap. You can't, and you can't find, because there's no indication of hacking. There's just zap. And this is one of the big, and then plus, uh, my co-author, for example, Bobby Kennedy, who uh, wrote uh, the investigation of vote theft with, uh, for Rolling Stone magazine with me and is a co-author, wrote a couple chapters of my current book, Billionaires and Ballot Bandits. He wrote the chapter in Billionaires and Ballot Bandits called Stuffing, which is one of the nine ways, good old-fashioned ballot stuffing. But he was talking about ballot stuffing done with computers. You don't need to hack. Uh, he talked about the case of the governor of Alabama, Democrat, won re-election by, you know, 10, 20,000 votes. Uh, already declared victory, it was, the election was over with, and suddenly a Republican county says, oh wait, we, have a, we seem to have a problem, we have to recount the votes. They take the, the computers, 
into the county courthouse, lock the doors, no observers, no press, no one. By the morning, they come out and say, oh, it seems that we had lost 30,000 votes in the machines. And now we found them, right? So suddenly, in other words, if you want, suddenly your votes go, your opponent's votes go poof. Or the other thing is you just take the machine in, and because there's no paper trail, there's the numbers. Oh, well, there's a lot of votes there. And even if it's more than the number of voters, it doesn't matter. Say, well, what do you want us to do? That's what the tally is, right? Who, who knows whose votes they are? Who knows why the extra votes are there? Who knows why there isn't? And what happened was, by the way, you ask why, why Al Gore didn't stand up, besides the $100 million that he ended up pocketing by being a good boy. There are those, there's, this is a case in which the politicians screamed bloody murder that it was a steal. Don, the guy that lost on that ballot stuffing case was then quickly arrested for bribery. Today as we speak, he's serving in federal prison. Why? Because they came up with some cockamamie bribery case. And you have to understand, 50 attorneys general of the United States, most of them Republican, say this is a phony case. We don't jail politicians for the obvious, for the crime of complaining about the vote count because he said, I'm going to bust these guys. These guys stole the, the election. You, you break the rule that, that in the boys club that you just shut your mouth. It's just like prize fighting. When you're, when you're, it's your night to go to the mat. If it ain't your night, you know, like an on the waterfront, if it ain't your night, you don't stand up and take an extra punch because they'll take care of you. Okay, just like, it's just like in, on the waterfront. So he said, he broke the code, man. He said, well, I won, they stole it, they stuffed the ballots in the computer. They just cranked them in overnight. And that was, so he's literally serving, he's in a federal pre, a penitentiary now. How many governors in America have gone, we've caught governors with, you know, with literally with bricks of cash in their refrigerator and they're not in prison. You know, so, you know, the, it, you don't complain about losing the vote this way. You just don't do it. It's not done. Who owns these voting machines? Who owns these voting machines? Oh, that, that's fascinating. Of course, if you're going to have voting machines, you've got to make sure your buddies own the, the machines. <laughs> and so, for example, and sometimes you own them yourself. One of my favorites is that uh, one of the biggest voting companies, uh, es and uh, one of the first and biggest of the vote uh, voting companies, uh, the computer voting companies, ESNS, was owned by a guy named Chuck Hagel. So Nebraska put in his machines, and he runs for Senate, and uh, Senate, and and he runs for Senate. And miraculously, he's a Republican. Miraculously, according to his machines, he got this gigantic black vote in Omaha. Now, how does a Republican suddenly get a gigantic black vote in Omaha? Well, he says, "Because I'm a nice guy." I'm just a nice guy, you know, I don't know, maybe he's a break dancer, I don't know, you know, what's, what's his, you know, I don't know. Um, and the guy who did lose, the Democrat, did say to me, you know, he was, he was cautious, he doesn't want to overdo it because he saw, you know, what happened to the governor of Alabama, you end up, they, they take care of you. But he did say, he thought it, he at least said, I do think it's mighty suspicious that all these black voters suddenly voted for the Republican on Chuck's own machines. So Senator Hagel was elected when, when, when Senator Hagel put in his own voting machines. You know, I mean, come on. It's, uh, it's, it's so in your face. And that's, that's an interesting issue in America. It can be in your face, and Americans say, well, it's just like, you know, it's kind of, well, you're kind of smart if you do that. I mean, a guy like Karl Rove, who uh, Bobby Kennedy, my co-author and co-investigator, He's a dean of the law school at Pace University. He's a law dean. And he says, Karl Rove should be in prison for this. But you don't mess. In fact, I have a case. In fact, um, a federal prosecutor did want to go after Rove, David Iglesias. He's a Republican. He was the Republican prosecutor for New Mexico. I was talking about this, the vote theft in New Mexico. But the Republicans are also going after Hispanic voters. He was told as a prosecutor, go after Hispanic voters. Here's phony voters from the caging list. And so he said, okay, he's a prosecutor. I'll go, if, the, if there's an illegal voter, I'll arrest him. He couldn't find one. 
this is the new phony thing. Oh, there's all these fraudulent voters. He said he chased all over the mesas of New Mexico, right? Couldn't find a single fraudulent voter. Okay. Um, couldn't find one fraudulent voter. Then they told him, he said, the Justice Department, the Republican Party told him to go arrest someone anyway. He says, this isn't the Soviet Union. We don't just arrest people. We can let them go after your election. He said, wait a minute. We don't bring federal prosecutions against innocent people. And so he complained about it, and he wanted to blow the whistle on it, and he wanted to arrest people like Karl Rove, setting up these phony attacks on the voters. And um, so he was fired. Karl Rove, senior counsel to the president, told the president, this guy's coming after us, fire him. So they fired him. And here's the thing. If you've ever seen the film, A Few Good Men, David Iglesias is the Tom Cruise character. The, the guy, the, the, he's, the, uh, he's the naval prosecutor who said, I want the truth. Give me the truth, right? That's this guy. So this guy is a stand-up guy. He wasn't going to take this crap. So they fired him. And they fired him. What was the excuse? He was uh, absenteeism. He, he didn't show up for work. Of course he didn't show up for work. He's an, he is a U.S. military prosecutor. And Bush had sent him to prosecute the war crimes trials, uh, prosecute the war crimes trials in Bosnia. So he was running the war crimes prosecutions in Bosnia, sent there by Bush. Bush fires him for not being at his job in New Mexico. So you know what he did? It's against the law in the United States for an employer to fire a, a military personnel who, are, uh, who are, are on duty. If you're called away from your job to serve, you can't lose your job. So he fired George Bush as his boss saying, because you, George Bush, my commander in chief, sent me off to Bosnia, but then you, as my boss in my, at the Justice Department, you fired me. So he actually sued Bush over the firing, his illegal firing as a, uh, a military prosecutor. So he stood up, but it's pretty rare. If you want to build a career, he's, again, he's a, he was a Republican star. He could have been. Everyone assumed he was going to be a Republican senator or, uh, uh, you know, governor, uh, but he just wouldn't go along. And that's the end of your career. And, or in the case of Selig, uh, Seligman, he's in prison. They don't, they're not nice about complaining about the vote theft. Greg, final question. Not too long before the, uh, the uprising uh, or the insurgency in, uh, in Syria, they had an election. The results of the Syrian election versus the results of the U.S. presidential election, which would you trust more? At least the vote in Syria I would trust because I would trust that everyone knows it's a fake and a phony. Just like when Saddam Hussein got 101% of the vote. No one buys it. No one believed it. But there are still people today who believe that George Bush won the elections of 2000 and 2004. And that's the sick, evil thing, is that, yeah, we see these dictatorships steal elections. The U.S. government, for example, would not certify the election in the Ukraine because it was a mismatch with the exit polls. This was only months after the exit polls in Ohio showed that John Kerry won the presidency. And yet, the, the same, the very same Republican officials, the very same Republican officials who said, oh, the exit polls must be wrong, said we will not certify the election in the Ukraine. It was overturned. International pressure overturned that election. So do I trust the Republican or Democratic? Do I trust U.S. elections as much as I trust them in Syria? Well, I trust in Syria that everyone knows that it's shoplifted. In America, I trust that the American media and the American elite will make sure that the suckers don't know they've been suckered. Greg, thank you very much. You're very welcome.